Uh, I'm not sure how many of you may have been here earlier today when I spoke about uh, the Awakenings experience and showed some of the documentary from that. Um, but uh, I, uh, I'm going to choose a different subject this evening, although for me all subjects touch on each other. Um, and my subject is supposed to be narrative and medicine, which sounds rather, rather formidable. Um, I try to concentrate on, on other things during the meal, but sort of the, the thoughts come a little earlier when um, there was a mention of Bank One and a loan from Bank One. I had an intermediate thought. It might be nice to have a gift from Bank One. <laughs> and, um, um, but then this was immediately followed by the thought, the patient gives you his history and, uh, and you take it. And somehow what the medieval people used to call the circle of grace, of giving, receiving and returning, I think applies very much to, to giving and taking histories. Um, and uh, now I'm... We were talking a little bit at dinner about dreams, and I think I'm going to mention an odd clinical experience when I was a medical student. Uh, we had an old tea planter who was dying of uremia. This was before the time of kidney transplants or dialysis, and he was delirious. And my chief said to me, you don't have to spend much time with him, just you know, check his physical signs. Uh, he's muttering, don't pay any attention. He's delirious. But I couldn't help paying attention. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time with him. And his mutters started to acquire meaning for me and um, certain figures and certain memories and certain landscapes kept recurring. And this was very extraordinary. It was like being privy to a dream. And then after a while, I started talking with him as he was delirious. And, um, and he answered in terms of his delirium, and he answered me. Um, now, um, one of the things which struck me was that he would say things like, there's a wall ahead. Now, who was he telling? And why was he telling? And why was he making a report on a wall ahead? And this is very different, for example, from... Um, now, I think... Uh, to some extent, I think a delirium is like a, a particularly disorganized dream which comes out in terms of, of audible and visible expressions. But I think one also talks and tells things like this when one is dreaming. A dog doesn't. A dog might make uh, chasing movements and you might infer that he's running after a rabbit, but he doesn't say, there's a rabbit over there. Whereas in our dreams, we do say it. And um, so I want to bring this out as a very primal thing, that even in dreaming or delirium, we make report, we tell, we tell a story. Uh, if you want, I think this is one of the differences, say, between veterinary medicine and human medicine, uh, that we must also listen to the story. And also patients have got to tell what it's like. Um, the De Quincey talks about the pressure on the heart of the incommunicable. I think that whenever someone becomes ill, they have a need to communicate it, perhaps especially to us, and to find words or terms in which they can do so. You know, we, we are talking creatures. 
Um, even when Robinson Crusoe was on a desert island, he kept talking. He was talking to himself. But once we are conscious and once we have language, we have to keep talking and to make report and to say what our inner states are like and if there are any changes in this. Um, I very recently, just this month, uh, wrote and published an article, it's in the New Yorker, about a man who had been blind all his life, or really since infancy, but was given sight at the age of 50. It was not known whether the operation would be successful or not. It was first thought, either it will succeed or it will fail. Probably it will fail, but maybe the scales will fall from his eyes and he will receive sight and he will suddenly become a sighted man and come out and, um, and tell us all about it. Um, the Bible, especially the New Testament, is full of stories of people who receive sight and then they, um, then that's that. Now, this wasn't the case with this man. Um, what happened was that when the bandages were taken off the day after surgery, there was a very long silence and he looked very bewildered. And only when the surgeon said, well, focus and um, attention appeared and he gazed towards the surgeon. His account later, and this was not an easy account to elicit, uh, was that when the bandage was taken off, there had been a blur of movement and color without clear shape and certainly uh, in no sense recognizable as an object. Um, and only when a voice came out of the middle of this blur, saying, well, he said to himself, voices come from faces. This must be the face of my surgeon. But face for him was not a visual concept. He had no visual concepts. He couldn't recognize any objects. He was agnosic, like the man who mistook his wife for a hat, but for a different reason. The man who mistook his wife for a hat had lost, had had damage to the interpretive parts of the brain. Whereas with this man, there was no damage to the brain, but the brain hadn't developed. And so he saw, but he didn't know what he was seeing. Now, this was a deeply confusing state to him. Really, he found himself under a cataract of raw sensation, violent color, light, movement, and he couldn't make any sense of it. And also, he couldn't give any report. He didn't have the categories for describing what was going on. Um, I spent quite a lot of time with this man and basically one of the things I tried to do was to help him to make sense of his experience. Um, you know, we feel and touch things and for us, you know, uh, a, a, a touch square looks like a sight square. With him, there was no carryover. When he looked at a square, he didn't know it was a square. And he had to correlate one sense with another. And he also had to correlate what was going on with language. Now, this, um, I think I bring this up. I didn't mean to talk about this man, but somehow, in a sense, this confusional state of having something very strange going on and not knowing what the hell it is and not having words and not having categories or concepts to describe it seems to me, in a sense, the position of some of our patients or the position of all of us 
if we become ill. In, um, when I showed um, uh, this afternoon, when I was talking about awakenings, I read something from a journal which one of the patients had kept. All the patients kept journals. I keep a journal, but they weren't just imitating me. Um, it was very, very astonishing to see these people in a deeply perplexed and perplexing situation, an unimaginable situation. These were people who had been profoundly ill for decades, um, and out of the world and abandoned, and in some sense things were at a standstill for them, and suddenly they were reanimated and thrown into the world. And, and sensation and feeling and sound rushed in on them. Uh, I mean, they, they were not agnosic like this other patient, but it was very difficult for them to, to make sense of it all and to come to terms with it. Um, we have got updated bit by bit. Uh, but this was not the case with some of these patients who had sometimes fallen suddenly, as it were, from their 20s to their 60s. This was very clear with one patient who said, I know I'm 64, but I feel I'm 21. And uh, this was a woman, uh, I, um, I call her Rose in the book, who, who came to a stop in a way in 1926. And when she was animated by L-Dopa, she, um, she immediately started talking of Gershwin and people from the 20s as if they were contemporaries and she had the gestures and the language of a much younger person. And she looked like a, like a flapper, come to life. Um, but she wasn't disoriented, but she was very, very dislocated in time. Um, we had to help these people deal with the dislocation one way and another. Um, we weren't, we weren't always successful. But one point I want to bring out is that virtually all of the patients, even poorly educated patients, asked for paper and pencil. They wanted to talk, they wanted to tell it and to say what it was like, but they also wanted to write it. And, um, and so again, I think this business of making a report, making a communication, well, it's not always a communication. There was one patient who kept very voluminous notebooks. She never let me see them. She said, they're not for you. There's something about the act of telling and writing. Um, I don't show my notebooks to people, but I often don't show them to myself. Um, but somehow the act of writing or the act of telling it, even if it's never looked at again, I think helps clarify things. Now, when I was a patient myself, um, which is an experience I describe in, in a leg to stand on, uh, <laughs> uh, which, which I, 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 I hope I continue to have two legs to stand on. <laughs> um, well, I, I had a fairly severe neuromuscular injury in, in one leg, and it was in a cast and I lost a lot of the movement and a lot of the feeling in the leg, and I also lost the sense that the leg was mine. Um, I don't know whether any of you have, um, I don't know, have had a spinal anaesthetic, for example. Um, nowadays, for, you know, uh, in childbirth, they, they give little subdurals, but if you have a real spinal, which sort of transects the cord, um, if when a real spinal takes effect, as you know, if you've had it, but you may not know if you haven't had it, you don't just become numb from the waist down, you disappear. You terminate here. And what lies below is in some sense not you, not flesh, and not real, and not anything. And the mind cannot make sense of it. Um, it's a very bizarre sort of situation. Sometimes one has minor forms of this if one falls asleep on a nerve and 
uh, and, and your arm sort of flails in front of you like, like a piece of, of dead meat or, or whatever. Um, and you will call it dead meat. Well, actually, that's not a bad term, but really, it's not like anything. It's not like anything. It's not like you. And the whole dentist now only put a local on one side of the mouth. If you put a local in both inferior dental nerves, you suddenly become agnathic. You lose the sense of having a jaw. You lose the sense of your tongue. And, you know, I'm sure all of you have had partial experiences like this. Um, they are very, very difficult to communicate. Um, and one doesn't, in a way, have the category to do this. Um, a simpler thing, actually, is simply to have an ischemic cuff round the arm. And then after a while, your arm will become dead meat, or it'll become not you, it'll become alien. Um, now, when this happened with my leg, um, I, I had the greatest difficulty communicating this. At first, I had the greatest difficulty communicating it, it to myself, because really the mind doesn't have any categories for this sort of thing. One uses a word like alien and uncanny, but these are only words. Uh, one can't really say what it's like, which is one reason why in a recent edition of A Leg to Stand On, I've said that for preference, the book should be read under spinal anesthesia. <laughs> um, because only then will the reader know what I'm talking about. I wanted to tell the surgeon what it was like, and I couldn't, partly because it was so strange, and partly, I think, because the communication, no communication was, would be received. He saw this as a surgical matter or a mechanical matter. He said, look, you've torn the tendon, you've done some nerve damage, I've repaired the tendon, the nerves will heal, so what's the matter? And I wanted to say, it doesn't feel like me, or it's not mine, or it's uncanny, um, but, this, uh, but this is not language one can very easily use to a surgeon. <laughs> and yet, um, and yet I found, for example, I was not the only person on the orthopedic ward with problems like this. Um, almost all of us with damage of one sort and another, and often long casting, had disturbances of body image. <coughs> disturbances of body image occur rather quickly if the body isn't moving properly. Um, and they're not conf this isn't confined to human beings. With a monkey, if you put a ligature around a couple of two of its fingers the next, and, re and remove it the next day, it can't separate the fingers. It uses them together. The, body, the image of the two fingers has de-differentiated, and the monkey has to learn to use the two fingers separately. Um, now, this sort of disturbance in body image happens very rapidly in all sorts of orthopedic situations. Um, it needs to be told. It's not often told. Um, it's difficult to tell, but it's also difficult to receive a story. Uh, well, when I couldn't tell what was happening, I started writing it down. And um, I remember that on the ward, uh, a lot of the other patients became envious of me because they said, you, you lucky dog, you know, we're merely patients and you're making a book out of it. <laughs> um, I think the first thing one has to do as a doctor is to listen and to attend and somehow to be hospitable and accessible to stammered reports of strange experiences. We don't have any language for pain, for example. And we have all these words like boring and lancinating and, and, and this and that. But there's, there's, there's no language for pain. <clears throat> um, now, the, the patient has the experience. 
uh, and tries to tell it. We as doctors hopefully have the knowledge and the concepts, physiological knowledge, concepts, which will make sense of what he's trying to tell us. Um, so I think the first thing then is the, the patient starts to try and tell us what it's like. And we listen and we try and make sense of what he's telling us. And then we return the sense to him. We give him some concepts, and now he has concepts. He's more fortified this, and he can, by this, and he can tell us more. Telling a story, making a narrative, making a clinical narrative, is a collaboration. It's a dialogue. It doesn't come just from the patient. It doesn't come just from the doctor. It comes from the encounter between the two of you, between the two of us. What's the use of telling of this story? The story makes things clear for the patient, but it also makes things clear for the doctor. Uh, I think that medical understanding starts in stories. And I think this has always been realized, and Hippocrates talked about the importance of a pathography or a case history saying, saying what it's like. We know about diseases but the patient knows about being ill. And being ill is something which occurs in terms of experience and perception and feeling. Disease is something which occurs in terms of function and mechanism. The patient has one set, set of terms, we have another set of terms. Uh, I don't know whether something which I found very... Uh, inspiring when it was published in the late 60s was a wonderful book by Luria, the Russian psychologist. It was called The Mind of an Eminist. And I, I, I read about 30 pages of this thinking it was a novel. And then I realized it was a case history. Um, but it was a case his history which had the feeling of a novel in which was as vivid as a novel but at the same time, very accurate as science. And um, I thought that very, very remarkable. In another book by Luria, called The Man with a Shattered World, there's an alternation of voices. Luria does some of the telling, and his patient, Zizetsky, does some of the telling. Um, and what comes out, finally, is the sense of the encounter between the two people and the dialogue and how they each influence the other, and each learn, each is teaching the other, each is learning from the other, and together they get to a level of description and insight and beauty and pathos, which neither alone could, um, could achieve. And I think in some sense, uh, I mean, this is obviously an extreme example, and this was based on a, th on a very intimate, really, 30-year relationship between the patient and the physician, and between um, a very uh, inquisitive patient who wanted to explore what it was like, and, and an equally inquisitive physician who wanted to listen to him. But always, I think, there is this need to make a story, and it's great fun making a story. Um, you know, a lot has talked about burnout and, and indifferent physicians and angry patients who, who aren't listened to. And, uh, you know, and I think this act of just listening a bit and receiving a story and throwing it back and making a story with a patient is... Uh, um, you know, is, is one of the things which makes the medical life fun, and which is also makes it a sort of combination between, uh, really, between science and art, and between objective and subjective, and between rational thinking and, and emotional experience. Um, I, love, I love listening to stories and sort of helping, helping them come out and helping them take form and putting them back. 
um, stories. Um, I usually see four or five patients in a morning. I make brief notes on the patients, and then I go for a walk. I usually go to the botanical garden, which is just opposite the hospital. Um, I'm not thinking about the patients consciously then, but something's happening inside. When I get back to the hospital, I find four or five narratives are in my head and ready to type out. Um, if I ask what are these, who are these narratives for or what are they for, I'm, I'm not quite sure. They're, they're partly for me, but they're also for my colleagues. Um, they get in the hospital notes. Um, but um, I think there's a sheer delight in, in, in telling stories, and, uh, and, and medicine depends on this. Uh, when I was a medical student, I remember seeing a woman with syringomyelia. She, um, she had a flail arm with some painless burns on it and, uh, well, many, many other features of syringomyelia. And I remember she, would, she said to us, she said, don't think of syringomyelia as an obscure condition on page 920 in your textbooks. She said, think of me. Think of the story I've told you. Think of my appearance. Think of my heavy arm with the burn marks over, over the chair. Think of me, and it'll all come back to you. I find it very difficult to think in disembodied terms uh, and to have in my mind a sort of checklist of the symptoms and signs of syringomyelia. But if I think of Goldie Kaplan, and I can't forget her name any more than I can forget her, her condition, even though this was 30 years ago. Um, I think that as physicians, um, we don't have, uh, you know, our lives are very concrete. Everything is embodied for us. Every problem and every question is embodied in the clinical encounter and in patients. We are born storytellers. Both my parents were doctors, and for better or worse, I grew up in a household of medical stories. Um, they often seem to have a strange coincidence with, with the food. I mean, the pus came with the soup. Um, um, and um, Actually, my mother, who was a surgeon, was also very fond of cooking, and, and she would usually give recipes while she was operating, and so, so it would go, go both ways. <laughs> um, the, I think sometimes people who came to the house got frightened or appalled by these medical stories. Um, the, um, but I, I, I love them, and I sort of uh, I absorb them from the start. My mother loved telling medical stories. She, I would see her talking to the milkman or the grocer, sometimes for, for hours on end. It really didn't matter much whether she was talking to a patient or a student or the milkman or her, or her colleagues. This, 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 this sort of medical storytelling was much the same. Um, it's much the same with me. Um, I was asked earlier when I turned to popular writing. I said I had never turned, I hoped I had never turned to popular writing, and basically I didn't distinguish medical writing or academic writing from popular writing. I tried to tell a story, I would try to say how it was, and I hoped everyone could read it. Henry James once said, adventures only happen to people who can tell them, which is, which is a very interesting notion. Um, in a sort of terrible way, but also one which may be very fascinating, very edifying, I think illness is a sort of adventure. And I think we need to help our patients tell the story of their adventure into dark, sick, difficult, painful, alienated worlds. 
and how they may deal with these and how they may get out of them. Uh, telling the story itself is partly healing, partly. Uh, this is very beautifully discussed by Luria in this book, The Man with a Shattered World, where his patient with a terrible gunshot injury of the brain in some sense has no recovery, but in another sense comes to terms with things completely through recovering his own story and making sense of it. Now, one of the things which surprised me is that medical stories apparently interest people outside medicine. I, so people came along to me after Awakenings was published and said, can we make a film of this? And the man who mistook his wife for a hat was made into an opera. And another tale of mine, The Disembodied Lady, was about to be made into a ballet, but, but it flopped <laughs> heavily. Um, and... Um, uh, when, when The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat was published, I got thousands of letters, and I still get innumerable letters. People would ask about Jimmy, the amnesiac, the lost mariner. They'd say, how is he? And this seemed to me very strange at first, because amnesia is pretty rare. One wouldn't think it was of any, of any general interest. But, but it is, apparently. I think that these clinical stories, which we are privileged to hear and sometimes to communicate, have strange resonances for everybody. Um, they're allegorical. They're stories of courage. They're stories of going through. They're stories of terror. They're stories of strangeness. Um, I think it's very interesting that uh, that stories like this do get taken up by dramatists and poets and, and so forth. I was at first rather embarrassed and upset when people said, can we make an opera of your case history or can we make a film? And I said, no, of, of course not. This would be unprofessional. But maybe it was unprofessional to write the case history in the first place. But then I'm not sure where professionality ends or begins. Um, I worried quite a bit after Awakenings was published. It was originally published in England. I tried to prevent the American publication. I thought, well, the patients are here in New York, but if I publish over there in England, they won't know about it. But one of the patients who was very sharp got hold of the English edition very rapidly, and, and it was blown. Um, but it was nice to find that, in fact, even though I had converted the patients, in a sense, into characters, they were still my patients. The relationship still stood up. Um, you know, we all tell stories. We tell them at dinner. We tell them over coffee. Um, I tell them in print. Uh, I tell them to more people. I tell them in more detail. But I don't know that this is essentially different. And uh, I think I probably want to end up by saying that uh, I don't, I'm sometimes called a physician and an author. I don't quite like that because my authorship is entirely to do with being a physician. All I do is to tell stories or to tell their stories or rather to tell the stories which have emerged through a relationship between the patients and myself. Um, I love doing this, and, um, and other people seem to love it, and I think we all love it. And um, uh, I should have had a proper ending here. I, um, uh, I don't, but I, I think I simply want to say that listening to the story, making the story, and telling the story was where medicine started. And whatever advances one has with PET scans and, and everything else, I think that this listening to the patient, getting his story, and portraying an individual will always remain at the heart of medicine. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.